So I'm going to see how good I am at juggling here, papers and a microphone, you know. Um, I'm, I'm so honored to be here today with you, and thank you very much. Oral health is one of those dimensions of our healthcare delivery system in which striking disparities exist. More than half of the population does not visit a dentist each year. Poor and minority children are substantially less likely to have access to oral health care than their non-poor, non-minority peers. Vulnerable and underserved populations include but are not limited to racial and ethnic minorities, immigrants and non-English speakers, children, especially those who are very young, pregnant women, people with special needs, older adults, individuals living in urban and underserved areas, uninsured and publicly insured individuals, homeless individuals, populations with lower socio economic status, and the list probably goes on, you could tell me. I learned about this disparity when I was in the legislature, and I was conducting a hearing, and I have no idea what the hearing was about, I will never remember that, but I remember a mother who came to testify, and she came up to the microphone, and I always listened very carefully when the public would come to testify because, you know, it's pretty intimidating and it's not a very easy thing to get up in front of a whole big room full of people and talk about your personal situation. So I was listening intently to her and she was telling us that her daughter had a cavity and her daughter had oral pain from the cavity and because they were on Medicaid, she couldn't find a dentist who would make an appointment to see her daughter. And her daughter's oral pain was such that, you know, she was having trouble attending school. And so her mother, every morning, would be putting fingernail polish on that daughter's tooth to try to um, keep the air from getting in that cavity and, and harming her in a way that she would feel pain. Now, I will never forget that story, and that made me a champion for our public clients getting access to oral health care from then on. So, you know, I'm also um, very passionate about the idea that oral health and physical health are connected. And um, so the consequences of the disparities that we see in Minnesota to oral health care have a strong influence on people's overall health. Poor oral health can lead to malnutrition, childhood speech problems, and serious and sometimes fatal infections. And poor health is associated with uh, diabetes, heart disease, and premature births. Oral disease in pregnant women and young mothers can be transmitted vertically to their offspring, perpetuating a cycle of disease. So we must recognize and pursue a variety of options that can help reduce these disparities. And I'm going to discuss some today that may not have been pursued to the extent they could be in Minnesota. State laws need to be changed to include in the practice acts better access to oral health care. We need to have allied dental professionals able to practice to the full extent of their education and training. And we need allied dental professionals to work in a variety of settings under evidence-supported supervision levels. And we need to allow technology-supported remote collaboration and supervision. Another area that we could look at in Minnesota is use of the Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant to evaluate and assess case management services to determine the most effective strategies to expand access to oral health care. We also could have DHS look at 
and help facilitate federally qualified health centers in operating programs outside their physical facilities and take advantage of new systems to improve oral health of the population that they serve. This could enhance payment and reduce paperwork to dentists that may not serve public clients today. So understanding that oral health is an integral part of overall health, and therefore oral health is an essential component of compre comprehensive health care is important. So let's look at some ways that coordinating physical and oral health care could improve outcomes. I'm going to talk about six examples here today. The first is non-dental health care professionals can incorporate oral health into their routine exam and wellness visits with basic risk, risk assessments, oral exams, anticipatory guidance, and the provision of basic preventative services. For example, fluoride varnish is increasingly being applied by non-dental health care professionals and in community-based settings. An example is North Carolina's program, Into the Mouths of Babes, which targets children from birth to age three. The project aims to improve practitioners' oral health knowledge, incorporate caregiver and parent counseling, and provide fluoride varnish applications, all done in primary care practices. They also aim to increase screenings and dental referrals for children with oral disease or who are at risk of disease. The second project I'd like to talk about is one that impacts emergency department use by patients who are having oral health problems. The emergency department is not well suited to treat these problems. Few have the equipment or staff necessary to diagnose and treat dental disease. Likely, as a result, emergency department visits are more likely than non dental emergency department visits to result in a prescription for antibiotics, pain medication, and a referral to another provider. This method of care increased costs because insurance must pay both for an unnecessary ED visit in addition to a follow-up dental appointment. Hennepin Health created a diversion program for patients presenting in the emergency department so that they could be seen that same day by a dental provider. The program also provides education to patients about the connection between oral health and physical health. This project uses community health workers to make appointments and to provide education to patients. Community health workers are not just for primary care clinics. They can help make dental access possible as well. I am proud to say that this project was supported by the dental, uh, Delta Dental Foundation and our, our emergency department staff at Hennepin County Medical Center have been very happy to have this service because they know that the services they provide will not solve the patient's problem. A third project I'd like to talk about is a case management program in New York State. They took a multi-pronged approach to increasing Medicaid dental utilization in a rural county. The case manager recruited dentists through presentations, letters, phone calls, and mailings. And to assist with billing concerns that the dentists had, the case manager arranged billing training for dental office support staff tracked billing problems until they were solved, and informed dental offices when patients lost or gained Medicaid coverage. The case manager addresses clients con the, the concerns about clients missing dental appointments by educating patients about the importance of oral health care and the appropriate use of oral health care and help patients select dentists that were uh, convenient to their work or home. They made appointments and followed up with patients when the dental office could not reach a patient or the patient had a missed appointment. 
During the course of the case management program, the number of dentists participating in the program went from two to 28. And the percentage of Medicaid eligible patients receiving dental care increased from 9% to over 40%. Other comparable case management programs in other states have had similar results. The fourth project is one that uses telehealth technologies as an emerging strategy to provide dental services in underserved communities where significant barriers to receiving care in a tra traditional dental office exist. The University of Pacific Arthur A. Dugoni School of Dentistry has initiated a four-year demonstration project for providing basic oral health care services to disadvantaged populations in remote locations. Dental professionals, including registered dental hygienists, registered dental hygienists in alternative practice, and registered dental assistants, provide screening, preventative services, temporary restorations, case management, to low and disabled individuals. These are patients in nursing homes, public schools, and residential homes for the developmentally disabled individual. They are under the supervision of a dentist who is linked to the remote location electronically via um, portable video camera. The professional in the field electronically sends diagnostic information uh, for instance, physical examination history, photographs, x-rays, to the dentist who reviews the material, makes a diagnosis, and develops a treatment plan. Then the field-based professionals provide preventative services such as oral hygiene instruction, fluoride varnish, temporary restorations, and refer the patients needing dental services to dental clinics or private practices. In some cases in this project, dentists come to the remote site with portable equipment and provide services. At this time, they are providing services in nine remote sites. The fifth project I'd like to talk about is in a neighboring state of Wisconsin. The Marshfield Clinic in rural, in rural Wisconsin has been successful at reducing oral health disparities through a targeted multi-site federally qualified health care, health center approach. As of July 2010, Marshfield Clinic operated seven dental clinics in rural Wisconsin. That number was projected to increase to nine in 2011, and they plan to operate 16 dental clinics through the state by 2016. By 2016, the Marshfield Dental Clinics will have the capacity to provide over 400,000 visits per year to 158,000 patients in nearly 400 locations staffed by 91 dentists and 69 hygienists. Marshfield has a four-part strategy for reducing oral health disparities in their community. The first is regionalizing care. The second is integrating dentistry with medicine. The third is treating all populations. And the fourth is training its own workforce. To efficiently reach a dispersed rural population, Marshfield opened clinics in regional centers, which were often county seats. This strategy allowed them to place multiple dentists at each center where they suspect this might improve dentist recruitment and retention. Marshfield integrated dental records into their medical records and vice versa, which has prompted their physicians to educate their patients about oral health and refer them to dental clinics. And it gives their dentists full access to patient medical records. In addition, each clinic is accessible to people um, with special health care needs, including wheelchair-accessible locations. And finally, Marshfield is in the process of establishing a dental school to train dentists specifically to work 
with underserved and vulnerable populations in rural areas. Three years after Marshfield opened its first dental clinic, the publicly insured population in the county where it is located accessed care at the same rates as those who have private coverage. In addition, costs per visit have decreased over time because the burden of disease has decreased in the population. The last project I'd like to tell you about is in, was in Massachusetts, uh, conducted under the auspices of Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And it provided integrated medical and oral health coverage with the aim of improving overall health outcomes and removing barriers to oral health care among its vulnerable beneficiaries. So they targeted beneficiaries with diabetes, coronary artery disease, and oral cancer, and women who were pregnant that, and these were clients that had both medical and dental coverage. They were automatically enrolled in a program that provides enhanced dental benefits. These individuals are eligible to receive additional services, such as cleaning or periodontal maintenance every three months at no additional cost. According to Blue Cross claims data, this approach has lowered medical costs among patients with diabetes and coronary artery disease. Blue Cross claims data from 2009 showed that beneficiaries with, cardi with coronary artery disease and diabetes who received these services had lower per member per month medical costs than beneficiaries who did not receive the treatment. In an amount of $487 per member per month and $67 per member per month respectively. So, we have a lot of examples around us that we can look at for inspiration. But one of the recent things that's happened in Minnesota to give me hope is the new managed care organization contracts that DHS has just entered into for 2016 will hold all health plans accountable through a withhold mechanism for increasing the number of patients that receive preventative dental visits per year. This may mean that reaching out to the managed care organizations serving your county could provide a productive and creative opportunity for developing new ways to reach more patients and to improve their oral health outcomes. Thank you so much for inviting me today and my best wishes to you who are on the front lines of improving the disparities we face in oral health in Minnesota.